Witches! Well, this certainly puts me in an awkward situation. I've spent the last several years desperately trying to pretend Ruby Chibi doesn't exist in the hopes that no one will ask me to review it, yet here I am making a review no one asked for to a sideshow no one paid attention to without anyone so much as batting an eyelash. I can almost hear the Chibi diehards coming down the street in my apartment complex with their pitchforks and torches to skewer me. But before you start going apartment by apartment, floor by floor, to drag me out and hang me from the nearest lamppost, let me explain myself. You see, Ruby Chibi is judged on the merits of being a spinoff with no real ties to the canon, whose only real personality is making meta jokes and generally being unfunny unless the villains are involved. There's nothing of narrative substance to really judge Chibi on. Frankly, making a review of this show would be wasting my time just as much as it would be wasting yours. If you're interested in hearing my thoughts on the show, just watch Judge Metal Critter's video on Chibi because she says everything I've ever thought about the show and more. But Fairy Tales of Remnant has a narrative purpose that we can analyze, even if that narrative purpose can amount to just the usual writing and consistency we can expect from the show. It's based on the book of the same name in E.C. Myers' continuous quest to be the lone Ruby novel writer, and to that front, he has kept that job active. I've read the three novels preceding this book, or rather, I read two of the books, and then Before the Dawn has been collecting dust on my bookshelf since I bought it. And while I wouldn't put him up there with the likes of my favorite authors, I can definitely see that the man knows how to spin a yarn, at least when he's not writing short stories about little boys purring on their sisters. I can certainly be cruel at times, but don't light the gasoline on those torches just yet, folks, because I'm here today to tell you that Fairy Tales of Remnant might just be my favorite spin-off of Ruby so far. Which is still like saying that of all these ancient statues constructed exclusively out of back guano, this one smells the least like shit. And the weird thing is, at first glance, you wouldn't expect it to be anything spectacular, because it's not like a minute for the animation quality. The animation is on the same level as Nomad of Nowhere. In fact, if you put the two shows side by side, I don't think you'd see a discernible difference. I don't really have anything else to say about it. Every complaint I had about Nomad's animation looking flat and awkward applies here as well, but it's the stiffness of the character movement that always makes it noticeable. Like, the way their models shift from side to side when they're talking feels like all these characters are suffering from some form of muscular atrophy. So that theory is shot right out of the gate, so all we're really left with is to talk about the stories themselves. Now the show is scaled down from the book as it took only six of the stories to adapt, well seven, two of the fauna stories are combined into one because of course the stories about the fauna should be cut down and combined. From what I understand the decision was made because Rooster Teeth only wanted a six episode season but honestly I think that was the best decision. I mean they gave RV14 a full season and we all know how that turned out so I don't begrudge this only being a six episode season because that means it doesn't overstay its welcome and it manages to present its stories in an even amount of time before it sends us off to have our pie. Anyway, the fairy tales are the kinds of stories you'd expect to hear from something clearly inspired by the Brothers Grimm or Aesop's fables. Tales of legendary warriors fighting for good, of gods and deities shaping the world, of characters faced with moral dilemmas and either making the right decisions and providing a good moral, or making the wrong decision and becoming a cautionary tale. There's nothing overall offensive or original about the concepts of these tales, and thus it doesn't raise much of a blip on anyone's personal radar, which is probably the reason the show has flown so far under that radar. I've heard complaints that the stories had details cut out of them for the animated series, and it's the same argument that has existed for years regarding book adaptations. Details are always going to be omitted in order to make a film adaptation work. You're never going to have a one-on-one -on -one perfect replica of the book you enjoy. And in some ways, this works to the book's benefit, and in other ways, not so much. In Fairy Tales of Remnant's case, I didn't feel that the omissions took me out of the stories at all, but I also admit that my copy of the book has been collecting dust since I bought it, so I can't be an accurate judge. But I can be a judge on the portrayal of the stories in the show, so let's not waste any more time and get on with it. First up, we have The Grim Child, and this illustrates a point I've been making for a couple years years now. Rooster Teeth needs to branch out and do more horror. And no, I'm not talking about that stupid Bloodfest movie. I'm talking actual horror, the kind that sinks in your bones and really messes with your head, like Day 5. Grim Child does just that. It's such a short entry into the series, but it leaves such a strong impact that shows Grim more as a disease than a tangible threat. And honestly, that's more effective writing on the Grim than any monster we've ever gotten in the show. On the other side of the spectrum, we have The Hunter's Children, and this is the story that left the least impact on me. I get that it's about how the Team of Four rule was established, but do we really need a story Worry about it, especially considering how little that rule is used outside of the huntsman schools where huntsmen and huntresses just seem to do whatever the hell they want solo or with one partner focusing on that plot point just seems silly. Coming up next is The Shallow Sea, which combined two fauna stories into one, and this one kind of left me scratching my head. If we're going off the assumption that all the fairy tales have some basis of truth in the real world, then that means that some wendigo head-ass looking motherfucker really decided the best way to stop the war between humans and animals was to create a bunch of chimeras. But only a few people got to be chimeras, and the rest of the world just looks at them the same way I look at a career politician as he strips rights away from people who just want to be left the hell alone. It just seems like a weird origin story for how the faunus came to be and why this deep-seated prejudice exists. It again illustrates the point I've made in the past in that the gods of Ruby really are like the gods of Greek and Roman mythology. They just kind of do whatever the hell they want and damn the consequences. 
Which is all well and good, I suppose, but just because really bothers me as a plot point. I'll explain a little further down what I mean about a good origin being the basis for a good overarching story, but given how they've handled the faunus in the show, I suppose I shouldn't be too surprised. The Indecisive King, now that one feels like a genuine Brothers Grimm fairy tale. It's short, sweet, and to the point, and has a good message about indecisiveness and trusting your gut. And it's clear the crown depicted was the relic of choice. However, outside of being a good fairy tale, I'm struggling to figure out how this story fits into the overall Ruby narrative. Maybe as a preview to something to do with the relic of choice. I don't know. But as a story on its own, it's pretty good. The girl in the tower, the big one, the one that the whole story revolves around. Now, I like to play this game when I'm watching shows. If you'll recall my RVB10 retrospective, I did it at the end of that video as well. See, when CT betrayed Freelancer and got the data to Tex, it served as the catalyst for the entirety of the story. Tex then betrayed Project Freelancer, the project fell apart, the director sent Alpha to Blood Gulch with the Reds and Blues. The entire story happened because one girl took it upon herself to be the deep throat to Dr. Church's Watergate. That's a good origin point. It causes a believable chain reaction, and the result is ten amazing seasons of story. Now let's look at Ruby. If this fairy tale is to be taken at face value, then all this started because an old man lost his wife and became obsessive over his daughter to the point of locking her away from the world. I know that doesn't seem like that big a thing, but now consider eight volumes of Ruby's story and everything that has happened, and now consider that all of this happened because some old dude a billion years ago decided that his daughter should spend her life locked away in one room in a tower. I guess your mileage may vary if this is an appropriate origin story, but the idea that all this spawned from toxic masculinity is a weird note to hold over your tail. But can you take the fairy tale at face value? Uh... Look, man, the Ruby creators go back and forth on so many things that you'd be forgiven for accidentally developing Stockholm Syndrome. At a certain point, you just gotta take matters into your own hands and fill in the blanks where they refuse to do so. And finally, at long last, The Warrior in the Woods, which is the tale that is to depict the Silver-Eyed Warriors. And this one is... Okay. This is your basic coming-of-age story with a hint of boyhood crush thrown in, and I like how they showed him coming to his own after being inspired by this girl. The callback to Summer is admittedly a little heavy-handed. I know it's not the same character, but it is Tai Yang reading the story, so you can fill in the blanks from there. But it's the fact that it is Tai Yang reading the story to the girls that really makes it stand out as a special story to these characters. And more than any of the others, I actually feel like the art style really complements the story the best. And there we have it. Six stories with varying degrees of equality and questionable degrees of value to the story of Ruby. It's hard to tell if any of these will actually matter to the overall Ruby story. There are hints of things past and there are hints of things to come, but ultimately they don't offer any real new lore or details to this world that is in desperate need for something concrete to base its identity on. I imagine this was only really put out so that there could be some Ruby content in between the extra long hiatus between Volume 8 and Volume 9 that fans could enjoy without really having to think about it. So then why? Why do I think this is the best? Why do I enjoy this more than any other piece of visual media regarding the show? Well, it's because when you get right down to it, these are fairy tales of Remnant. These are stories the people of Remnant tell to their children as bedtime stories, or stories from which their world's lessons are drawn from. And on that note, the show does the job it's set out to do. There's no false advertising with fairy tales. What you see is what you get. You get exactly what you paid for. I like fairy tales because it's honest about what it is. It isn't trying to be anything it isn't. And given how RT has burned us in the past about what their products are really about, it has something that is so unabashedly itself. It's just a breath of fresh air like the first gulp of freedom from the prisoner of the gulag. I talked before about how it's unknown if it will matter to Ruby proper, but in fairness, it doesn't really need to. It is what it is, and it stands on its own. In short, does Fairy Tales of Remnant add anything to the conversation of the show? No. Is it an enjoyable watch? Yes. And at this point, I can't think of anything better it could be.